Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Frank Vahid from UC Riverside. Uh, Frank has been involved in FPGAs, and that's what he's going to talk to us about in architecture. But he's also uh, teaching embedded systems and has some work in uh, <coughs> e-blocks. Um, so if anybody wants to talk to him, there's still at least one slot open, uh, either about this talk or other areas related to that. Frank? Okay. Thanks, Alessandro, and uh, thanks for coming. I wanted to thank Alessandro, first of all, for hosting uh, Scott Surway, who's uh, doing an internship here, and for arranging for this visit. And I just received this last night, and I wanted to thank him for this, too. <laughs> and I actually did receive this last night. It came from Microsoft Corporation. It looks like I've won your um, long-awaited sweepstakes results from your Foundation for Software Promotion. So $250,000, and I assume you had something to do with that, Alessandro. So thanks, I appreciate that. You slight dog there. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, let me uh, jump right into things here. So um, we have lots of transistors available today, and what uh, you know, Intel's doing is putting more and more cores onto chips and, and uh, putting more and more things on there. Um, another thing we can do is uh, you know, put different types of cores, so we can have big cores, small cores, and so on. So some really neat things going on in architecture, trying to figure out what to do with all these extra transistors that we have. Well, another direction that um, we're seeing happening is that people are putting FPGAs onto chips. And I'll talk a little bit more about what FPGAs are in a minute. Um, but what you're looking at at the upper right there are four PowerPC processors, surround, that's the four yellow boxes in the middle, surrounded by field programmable gate array logic. Um, on the far right, we're looking at an ARM9 processor, which is uh, pretty small all the way up in the upper right corner there, um, and lots and lots of FPGA. Uh, that's happening at the chip level. It's also happening at the um, board level. So uh, right here is a Cray XD1, uh, which unfortunately isn't made anymore, but it had a number of processors as long, along with FPGA. And uh, SGI is actually making supercomputers with FPGAs at the board level, and we actually acquired one last year. So uh, 64 Itanium processors and a number of FPGAs, all with equal access to memory. Um, AMD supports FPGAs now. Uh, the uh, Intel has announced that they're going to be supporting FPGAs more and more. So um, FPGAs are starting to uh, come into maturity, and they're starting to be supported by more and more platforms. Uh, they've been around about 20 years. So, um, and they're a very interesting way of doing computation. Uh, you guys have some really cool research going on here about using them. Let me give a, a quick background of what FPGAs are. So the fundamental concept of FPGA is that you can implement a circuit, a very simple circuit, using a memory. That's the basic idea. So let's suppose you want to implement this, very, this simple circuit here with A and B as inputs and F and G as outputs. I could use a four-word by two-bit wide memory, have A and B go in as the address lines, and just program that memory with ones and zeros so that F and G implement this NAND gate and this inverter. So that's the basic idea. Uh, you could have bigger circuits, of course. Um, and then I would take a bunch, I'd have a bunch of these memories, and I need to connect them somehow. And I want to be able to program those connections, because every circuit's different. And so I can create these programmable switches, or what are called switch matrices. So for example, I have two inputs on the left, two outputs on the right. And by programming the select lines of those two muxes, I can have A go to X, I can have A go to Y, I can have B go to X, I can have B go to Y. So I could have A go to both X and Y. Um, so just by programming bits, I can 
implement circuits, and I can implement programmable connections. And so the idea of an FPGA is just to take lots and lots of these little memories, uh, which are called lookup tables, and lots and lots of these switch matrices, literally thousands of them, and create, the, create a very regular grid of these things. And then just by programming zeros and ones, I can put any circuit onto that chip, any custom circuit onto the chip. And that's what you're looking at down in the corner there, that very regular structure that you're looking at other than the four processors is just a whole bunch of those look, look, lookup tables and switch matrices. By the way, Alessandro, the tradition here would be questions anytime, is that right? Okay, yeah. so, so please do. So. Um, okay, so that's the basic idea, and normally we don't have to actually figure out what the zeros and ones are, that's what CAD duals do for us. Uh, FPGAs have a very strange name, field programmable gate arrays. The reason why is that when they came out in the 80s, the, the most popular custom-made chip was called a gate array chip. And so these were like gate array chips, but you could program them in the field. Uh, there's no gate array inside of them, but uh, it's just in, in contrast to what was the, the standard technology back then. So. Okay, so why are FPGAs a, a big deal? Because they can implement circuits, and because circuits do computations and can, can do computations much faster than microprocessors sometimes. And here's why. For example, suppose that you want to just reverse um, 32 bits. You just want to take, take all the bits like this and, and flip them this way. Do you like this example? Why? <laughs> okay. So, you know, you'd write some, there's some very efficient C code to do it. Uh, and it would get compiled down to this uh, assembly instructions and you'd require somewhere between 38 and 128 cycles. Yes? Is that code faster than the four table lookups? What's that? Is this code up there faster than doing four table lookups, one on each byte? Uh, that would be another way to do it. So that would probably get you close to, close to that number of cycles. So, uh, on the other hand, as a circuit, it's just wires. So um, you could do it in one clock cycle. That cycle might be a little longer than a, a regular microprocessor, but still, it's just, it's just one clock cycle. Here's another example, an FIR filter, uh, where you're doing 128 multiplications and additions, and that would require th thousands of instructions uh, on a microprocessor. But as a circuit, you could create this kind of interesting tree where you have a, there are 128 multiplications right up front, and then you just create an adder tree going down, and you get your result. And this could be done in, in one cycle if you wanted one big cycle, or you could pipeline it and get it down to just a, you know, seven cycles or so, and you could even get very high throughput if it's pipeline. So you can see that you're going from uh, several thousand cycles down to just a few cycles. So that's the basic idea why circuits work well on some types of computations. Not all, but some. There's been lots of work over the last 10, 15 years showing that compared to different microprocessor platforms ranging from a, a 200 megahertz ARM all the way up to a 3 gigahertz um, uh, Athlon pro or Xeon processor, that um, uh, you can get pretty bit speed ups on certain types of computations. So looking at 10x speedups, 40x, this, we basically compiled this from a variety of papers. This comes from maybe a dozen papers from, from embedded system conferences, from uh, architecture conferences, from supercomputing conferences. Um, uh, 500x speedups to do uh, placement um, for, for CAD, uh, Fourier transforms, simulated annealing, and so on. So uh, very big speedups we're talking about, not 10%, 20%, we're talking 100x sometimes. The thing to note is that even though these are circuits, these circuits are software. It's just bits going into a prefabricated chip, just like we download binaries into a um, microprocessor. Um, however, circuits and hardware are sort of synonymous, right? When we say circuits, we think hardware, right? We say hardware, software, partitioning when we take things and put them on FPGAs. Um, that's something that I think we need to stop doing. <laughs> software and instructions is not the same thing. They're not synonymous. Software just means bits. Those bits can be either instructions or circuits. Uh, by the way, I just put up a quote there. I, I was just kind of curious, so I found the first 
believed use of the word software was in 1958. So that's the quote that came from, from a paper. So, um, so it's important to realize that circuits are software. They are just, uh, they can be software. They're just bits that are going to go into the lookup tables and the switch matrices. You download them into a chip, just the same way that you download a, pro, uh, a sequence of instructions into a chip. Um, I'm trying to get the community to stop calling circuits hardware. So this was an IEEE computer article that came out a few months ago. I don't know if you guys saw it, but maybe you guys can help too by, in your normal conversations, always use circuits instead of hardware. So, okay. Um, on the left here is a chart of Xilinx revenue. Xilinx is one of the two big FPGA manufacturers. You can see uh, it's very much a growth industry. Um, and Altair is about equal in terms of its revenues also. So what we're seeing is that we have a, a, very, pretty, a pretty good steep uh, increase here. They were just invented in the late 80s. Uh, Multi-billion dollar industry. You're starting to find FPGAs in more and more products. We have some recent announcements, um, especially by Intel, saying that, they're, that major computer makers are supporting FPGAs just in the last two years or so that these announcements have been coming out and that actual products are coming out. So I, I think we're at a point now where FPGAs are about to take off. It's, of course, very hard to predict, but it looks like we're at a transition here where, where uh, you know, it's su widely supported that people are going to start using FPGAs to do computation far more than they did before. It's hard to predict. I like to put up this example of trying to predict technology. This was a, uh, it's a little story about Alexander Graham Bell when he tried to uh, go to Western Union with his telephone patent and uh, see if they wanted to license it. And they said, why would we need a telephone? We have a telegraph. The information's getting across. What does it matter whether it's actual voice or not? So, um, uh, hard, so big mistake, Western Union is now just the fastest way to wire money as opposed to something bigger. Um, so I think FPGAs, we might be at that point now where we're transitioning from the telegraph to the telephone in terms of using, using FPGAs. I think they're going, to, they're going to really take off in terms of a computation platform, but you never know. Uh, the future is very hard to predict, right? Um, okay, so let me give you a little bit of background on the actual project that I'm going to talk about today. Um, starting with uh, what I was working on back when I was doing my PhD work at UC Irvine with Dan Geiske, from 89 to 94, we worked on a tool called Specsyn. And the idea was to take high-level language and synthesize it down to a microprocessor and circuits next to the microprocessor that would speed up the most important things. So rather than just compiling down to a microprocessor, we were trying to compile down to two things take the non-critical code, put it on the microprocessor, take the critical code, and create a custom coprocessor just for that program. Back then, FPGAs uh, had just been invented. 1986, is that about right? 86, 87 was when Xilinx came out. Um, and they had very little capacity. So we, I, I hadn't even heard of them back then. OK, fast forward a little bit to uh, around the year 2000. And right around, around year 2000 is when dynamic software optimization and translation was getting really popular. So for example, Hewlett Packard had their Dynamo system, where as a binary was executing, they would look for the hotspots and recompile those hotspots into a more optimized piece of code and then replace the existing binary by, by this re-optimized binary. And they could get 10, 15% improvements. Around this time, uh, uh, Java just-in-time compilers were coming out. Around this time, Transmeta Crusoe was uh, talking about their code morphing platform, where instead of trying to implement an x86 binary in a, in a somewhat more native way, they would just create whatever architecture they wanted, in that case a VLIW architecture, and on the fly just translate their um, x86 binaries to VLIW binaries. So underneath, um, it was all VLIW, but it could run x86 binaries. So, uh, and they got lower power and, and pretty good performance. So, and they were getting, all of these techniques were getting 10, 20, 30 percent maybe improvements. But remember the slide I showed you about FPGAs? And they get 100x improvements sometimes. 
not 10, 20 percent. So, um, and remember, FPGAs are software, just like a VLIW is implementing software. So we thought, why don't we dynamically take this binary and via some process put it on an FPGA or put the critical spots and instead of getting 10, 20 percent, we may get 100x. Yes? Why would you start with a binary? People who compile binary were forced to add x86 binaries and that was it. It is a, well, just was the worst possible source to compile from. True. On the other hand, uh, you know, if you want to add an architectural feature without having to change the entire industry, uh, you have to work with binaries because that's that's the that's the lingua franca of, of computation. Yeah, well, there's two, at least two projects here that start with uh, Java class files and compile those. Oh, sure. And that's, that's what I was doing back in 1989. Also, that, 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 that's that's my that's my roots. Okay, so I, I come from that. But I said, look, if I can do this dynamically from a binary, then I can put this into computers and people don't even have to know it's there. They don't have to recompile. They don't have to do anything. So, so that was the inspiration, was to see if we could do a just-in-time compilation, some sort of binary translation, um, and so that the FPGA would be treated sort of like a cache. It's just invisible. It just gives you, di it just gives you invisible performance improvements. So we started working on this project back in 2002. Um, to dynamically translate binaries to FPGA. So here's how it works. Initially, you would download a standard binary onto uh, a platform, and it would run on the microprocessor. And uh, the programmer, the compiler, nobody knows that there's an FPGA here. And you would get some time and performance, time and energy uh, characteristics from there. Meanwhile, a profiler would monitor the executing program, and it would eventually detect some critical loops. And what it would do then is, is read those critical loops while the program is still executing. It would read those into some on-chip CAD uh, program, which could be running on the same microprocessor or it could be running on a separate one. What we would then do is decompile the region into a control data flow graph. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about decompilation. And then we would synthesize it down to a circuit. So there's like an adder tree from the FIR I showed you earlier. And then we would take that circuit and map it into the uh, small memories and the switch matrices that, that are on an FPGA. So we'd maybe put the adders on, on those two blocks there, and then we'd run this wiring through those switch matrices. And once that's all done, uh, we would modify the original binary so that it would make use of the FPGA now for those critical regions. So the, the original code is, is gone and it's replaced by jumps to this FPGA here. And all of a sudden you get maybe 10x improvement in time and energy for some programs. For others you won't get any. Uh, but you might get 10x, maybe even 100x improvement. And, uh, and all of a sudden uh, we call that warping. Suddenly your program just starts running faster and using less energy. So that's the basic idea. So when you look at that uh, idea, you're immediately faced with two big problems. And one, the first problem is, is what you were addressing, right? Um, binaries are just a horrible starting point, right? I mean, you've lost your loops, you've lost your arrays, you've lost your functions, you've lost all that high level information that you really want in order to synthesize a good circuit. So the question is, can we somehow recover those high level constructs from binaries? That was the first question. The second question is for people who, who know what CAD tools uh, do or how long they, re they take to take a binary, or I'm sorry, to take source code and synthesize it down to a circuit on an FPGA, you know that runs for tens of minutes, sometimes hours, right? <laughs> so frustrating. So uh, that, that's a long time to, for this thing to be trying to do some sort of optimization on the fly. So is there some way to speed that up? So those were the two big problems, and those were the two things that we, we worked on uh, from 2002 up until about uh, 2006 or so. So one was decompilation. This is what happens if you don't decompile. If you, if you just take the, the uh, binary and feed it through a synthesis tool, okay, I mean, create it into a controlled data flow graph and then feed it through a synthesis tool, 
Uh, you want to be below this line on performance energy, and you can see that for these examples, everything's worse. Okay? The circuit you get is much slower than a microprocessor. So we need to recover some high-level information before we try to synthesize a circuit. So here's an example of for loop uh, that does some accumulation. Um, and this is what it would get compiled to at the assembly level. So our first step is to get that control data flow graph. Uh, so it, the control data flow graph looks a lot like the assembly. That's why synthesizing from it doesn't give us much improvement. But what we can then do is start applying decompilation techniques. And what we did was we actually built on uh, about 20 years of previous work on decompilation, which was more intended for binary to binary translation. So we looked through the literature and found a bunch of techniques that we said, well, okay, this technique would work well for us. This one would also be very useful for synthesis. Um, these two are not so important. So we went through and we found about seven or eight decompilation techniques. Uh, we had to build some of our own techniques, like we re-roll loops, for example. If you have an unrolled loop, we figure out what it was and we re-roll it. <laughs> okay. um, and we go through and apply these techniques and what, you, what starts happening is, little by little, the code that would come out of that control data flow graph starts to look more and more like the original. You do data flow analysis, so you get rid of some of the intermediary uh, registers from the assembly. And then you do some function recovery, so you can actually see where functions are in the code and you can isolate those. Uh, start to recover control structures, so we can detect loops, um, detect if statements, even uh, switches sometimes. Yes? The example assembly is some kind of, of risk code. Can you do it for the 86 with its uh, incredible 30 years of baggage? So we've been doing it primarily for clean instruction sets. We've been doing it for ARM, MIPS. Uh, we even did it for the Microblaze, which is a, a processor designed for FPGAs. Uh, most of the decompilation work has been done on x86 stuff. So the techniques have been de developed on x86. Most of our results, because we came from an embedded world, were for ARM and MIPS. Um, but actually, my student, who's now a professor at University of Florida, he's, uh, as we speak, doing it for, he's porting his tools to x86. So there's been plenty of decompilation work for x86. Um, what ends up happening, you can recover arrays. What ends up happening is you, you, can, you can recover um, a large amount of the high-level information from binaries. So we started doing some experiments to see how much could we recover. We looked at, in this case, a bunch of embedded system benchmarks. Uh, we did synthesis from C code, and we basically took um, the techniques that are used in various high-level synthesis tools that will take C code and generate circuits, and we, we, um, we basically did them manually to make sure that we weren't uh, suffering, uh, that we weren't using a tool that wasn't ideal. So this is, this is sort of the best case scenario for synthesis from C. And then we ran our, uh, the, the, the binaries of those same programs. We took the binaries, ran them through our decompilation tools, and then synthesized. And what you end up seeing is that there's uh, no time overhead, in the, in, at least for these examples. Uh, some area overhead, basically one example that was really bad there. Um, and just because synthesis and compilation, there's a bunch of arbitrary factors. For one example, from a binary was actually better. But that doesn't really mean anything. That's just noise, really. So. OK, so we did this for actually uh, dozens of examples. But we really wanted to, to make sure, and I'll, I'll tell you why. We, we got a lot of, um, to put it mildly, hostile reaction to the idea of synthesizing from binaries. In fact, um, my student back in 2003, he submitted a paper, and he got a rejection. And it was the most violent rejection <laughs> that we've ever experienced. And then, uh, so one guy was just, just blasting us for being just morons, you know. And then another guy, his review was just one sentence. It said, synthesis from binaries is just wrong. <laughs> 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 that was the entire review, right? Like we were committing some sort of moral transgression here. Um, we're scientists. <laughs> So, um, so in addition to those studies that we did, we went to one of our partner companies, uh, Freescale, and we said, look, we really want to do this on a serious benchmark that, is, you know, a real benchmark, uh, not just the stuff that you get online, but a real piece of software, and we want to see if we can speed it up at the binary level. 
So after several months of negotiations with them and lawyers involved, we got access to their, their actual H.264 video decoder, the one that they actually put on cell phones. Um, so it was a several million dollar piece of software that they spent several man years developing. Highly optimized, 10 times faster than the reference H.264 code that you can get. So we took that code as our starting point. We did our analysis. We found the critical regions. And we started to say, OK, let's see how we can speed these up. So this is the ideal curve. This is if we could take these critical regions of code and just eliminate them, OK? Uh, execute them in zero time. That would be the ideal speed up that you could get with an FPGA. So you can see if you did about 40 of those critical regions, you'd be getting about 10x speed up. So that's our upper bound. We can't do better than that. If you do it from the C level, this is what you get. So this takes into account the time it takes to transfer data over to the FPGA for the FPGA's computation to send the data back to the microprocessor. This is the speed up that an FPGA could give you over a microprocessor. I think this is over a 200 megahertz arm <coughs> uh, using a similar FPGA, so similar technology. <coughs> so now the question is, how do we do from the binary? So we went through, and this was about a four-month study that we went through and did this, and that's how we did with the binary. So barely off. We're maybe 3 4% off. So even with this highly optimized code, we were still able to be fairly competitive. But I still wasn't satisfied, right? Um, because we, we really got very, very hostile reactions. So we looked even further. We said, Let's try different architectures. So we tried the MIPS, the ARM, and the Microblaze. And we said, let's try different optimization levels. Because a common question we got was, well, if you don't do much optimization, decompilation works fine. But what if you do a lot of optimization in your compilation? Maybe it, you can't, it, it con confuses the assembly so much that you can't recover loops, you can't recover arrays, and so on. So I said, OK, let's, let's try different optimization levels. For the MIPS, this is, this is the speed up we get. Um, using an FPGA if the uh, code was originally compiled with a dash 01 optimization level. And this is the speed up we get if it was compiled with dash 03 with higher optimization. So um, about the same. So we didn't lose anything there. With the ARM, that's the speed up we would get with dash 01. That's the speed up we get with dash 03. Actually better, much to our surprise. We weren't expecting that. And likewise, for the microblaze, it actually gets better with the higher optimization. So we looked into this a little bit, and we found that you know, it's doing more constant propagation. It's reducing memory accesses. And so it's doing things that are good for the FPGA, too. Um, and we're not losing our ability to recover the high-level information. So that was a very surprising finding. OK, any questions on the decompilation work, the binary synthesis work? Yeah. You say when you turn on the optimizations, you might actually get uh, better results because it optimizes it. When you have the optimization up high, does the resulting decompile, decompile code still resemble the original C code, or does it look slightly different? It's very similar to the original C code. So in almost all cases, so uh, Greg actually did a comparison. He looked at the various features and tried to figure out what, um, what percentage of features we were able to recover. And the numbers he got were like 95 97%. So, Regardless of the optimization levels, we're able to get, um, we're able to recover the loops, the arrays, the functions, the, the if statements, and so on. Well, I have another thing. What if, uh, for whatever reason, whoever wrote the original C code just did something that's completely erroneous that doesn't make any sense, but the uh, compiler was able to catch it and compile it down to something a little bit better, and then you decompile it, does it still look that way? Or no, 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 no. no. <laughs> the whatever the compiler does, we can't. We can't um, reverse engineer uh, that type of stuff, right? But, but for straightforward code, and like embedded code tends to be fairly straightforward. There's loops walking through arrays and things, and uh, we can get a lot of it back. So, yeah? I assume this is coming up, but I'm curious, of course, about um, relative to the initial time to execute the kernel, how long does it take you to do this decompilation and this uh, FPGA synthesis? It's, it's, it's coming up in a bit, but I'll just give you the quick answer. It takes forever. So it's, it's, it's still an eternity, but, um, but it is practical in some cases. And um, th that's if you're using like on regular CAD tools. What I'm going to show you in the next two slides 
is uh, how we can at least ameliorate some of that problem. So, okay, so the second big problem with warp processing was this, exactly this, was how long does it take to do all this decompilation, the synthesis, the placement and routing onto the FPGAs. And so I'm just going to show you the results of that rather than diving into the details. Um, for a set of benchmarks that we looked at, using uh, uh, the most popular um, FPGA Xilinx and using their synthesis tools, we analyzed how long it takes to actually run the, the entire s sequence of taking a high-level piece of code and mapping it down to um, uh, an FPGA implementation. And these are the big contributors. Decompilation is actually just, it's just tiny. It's, it's negligible. So we don't even show decompilation here. But once you've got that high-level representation running through register transfer level synthesis, which is also tr uh, trivial so we don't show it, logic synthesis, technology mapping, placement, and routing, which is trying to figure out how to connect all those uh, wires of the circuit on the FPGA, that's, that's how much time it takes, and it takes about 60 megabytes of, of memory. So um, a different student, Roman Lysecki, who's now a professor at University of Arizona and still working on this, his job was to figure out how to shrink this. So he went and looked at each one of these and came up with, with techniques that were not solely focused on getting the fastest circuit, which is almost all work in CAD, is how to optimize that circuit. And instead, he said, well, how can I get a reasonable circuit in a shorter period of time? And our goal was 10x improvement. We want to get 10x faster flow here. So we want to get down to 0.9 seconds, basically. And just to make a long story short, this is what he came up with. So he was able to take each of those and shrink them down like this so that overall we got 0.2 seconds uh, of execution, a 30% slower circuit. So the trade-off is um, uh, you have a slower circuit, about 30% slower, but you have um, almost 20x now um, improvement. So what is that, 15x or so. Um, just for fun, he took that, his tool set, uh, which we call the Riverside JIT FPGA tools, and he showed that you can actually run these on a, on a 75 megahertz arm. The idea of running CAD on an, on an arm is, is, if anybody knows CAD, I mean, you really would never do that, right? And to run it on a 75 megahertz arm 7, I mean, that's really a wimp. That's, that's a wimpy, wimpy processor. He showed that his tools run on that and they would only take 1.4 seconds and still, of course, use only 3.6 megabytes. So, um, so that's kind of neat. If you can do CAD very efficiently, then warp processing becomes a little bit more feasible. Uh, these are some results we got using our entire tool flow. Uh, four uh, number of embedded system benchmarks. Um, compared to a 200 megahertz arm and using roughly equivalent FPGA. Uh, if, if 200 megahertz looks slow to you uh, and we use a 600 megahertz arm, that's fine, but then I'm going to use a faster FPGA, <laughs> okay? Um, what we were talking about in the hallway this morning, right? Um, so, we're, you know, we got, for these benchmarks, we got, you know, between 50, 200, sometimes 5, 10x speed up. On average, we got about 40x speed ups using the FPGA as a coprocessor, yeah? I gather the average arithmetic mean. How, what would be the geometric mean and the harmonic mean? Uh, Greg usually does geometric mean. This was Roman's work. He, I think he just took uh, arithmetic mean. I don't know, but we can sort of visually see it, right? It's, we're, not, we're not throwing anything way off, are we, with the 191 and the 130 there? So maybe 30x. Just, just looking at, just kind of eyeball it, and geometric mean be about 30. Uh, now this is just for the kernels. And, in, you know, actually when you look at papers that are doing speed ups using FPGAs, they usually only show the kernels. And that's a little misleading because you really want to, you really care about the application. So we also did this for um, the application. So looking at the overall application speed up, about 7.4. Just still pretty good. Just still getting close to an order of magnitude speed up. I have to point out that these examples are, are embedded benchmarks. They do get sped up. Um, there are lots of examples that don't. 
for example, we tried to do this with Spec, which is the normal desktop uh, application suite, and we, we basically couldn't get any speed up at all. So it just didn't work on those. There, there just weren't loops that were amenable to being sped up by circuits. Have you had any luck speeding up Spec? Yeah. The, the zip, B zip? Yeah. Okay. My problem is that they're all floating points. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that includes a lot of them. Um, although we do have, uh, now with the modern FPGAs, the floating point can be done reasonably efficiently, but the resources are somewhat limited. Um, okay, so moving on to some more recent work, some more recent directions of thread warping, uh, of warping. Uh, we looked at um, multi-core platforms, which are much more likely to be imp implementing multi-threaded applications. So let's, let's try to take this warping concept and apply it to multi-threaded applications. So we looked at an approach where um, you know, in the, the binary would be loaded onto a microprocessor, operating system would start scheduling threads onto available cores, and any uh, threads that weren't executing would be waiting in a queue. And so we looked at warp processing from the perspective of, well, let's look at that queue and take those threads, run them through our on-chip CAD, and actually put those threads onto the FPGA as custom circuits. So rather than being limited by the number of cores that we have on our uh, platform, we can synthesize as many threads as we want. You can synthesize 48 threads maybe, if you had 48 threads waiting. Um, and they would each be executing then in parallel. And then the operating system would schedule the threads onto those circuits. And uh, potentially you could get very large speed ups because you're looking at a, a level of parallelism here that is even greater than at the circuit level. You're basically creating on the fly multi core systems, creating as many cores as you want, but each core is specialized to execute just that thread. So uh, it's a fairly complex framework. I'm not going to talk about all of it, except I do want to sort of zoom into the one thing that was sort of the Achilles heel of, of this thread warping and the solutions that we came up with. If you know, uh, if you've been working with FPGAs and trying to do speed up, you know that uh, the memory bottleneck is often the Achilles heel, right? You, you can put 48 threads on here, sure, but they're all just sitting there waiting for some uh, bus to return data to it so it can actually compute, right? And so you don't actually get any speed up at all. You've probably <laughs> had this experience, right? So it, uh, you, know, you can have as much concurrency here as you want. It's all moot if you don't have enough bandwidth from the memory to feed the data to these things that they need to do their computation. Um, a lot of publications, when they talk about speed ups and FPGAs, they ignore that point, actually. They just assume the data's in the FPGA already. Uh, so that's a little bit cheating. So. Same for multi-core, yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so we looked at a number of multi-threaded benchmarks. Uh, there's a bunch out there. And uh, we noticed a couple of patterns that were common. Here's one pattern, which is that you've got a main program generating your threads. So here's, here's one that's creating 10 threads. They're all calling, uh, func they're all based on function f. Uh, they're all accessing array i but they're using some different constant here to multiply it. So there's basic, the, the basic pattern is that you've got a whole bunch of identical threads all accessing the same array. So the solution there is don't have each thread access the array itself. Instead have one thing access the array and feed that then to all of the, um, the threads simultaneously. So we wrote some tool, uh, um, algorithms that would identify the groups of threads, identify those constant uh, uh, arrays, those constant memory accesses, um, and then would actually synthesize a separate custom DMA that will handle uh, the access of that array. So uh, these threads, when they're activated, this DMA will actually, on their behalf, fetch the data they need, push it into all of them, and then those guys all have their, their data. 
And you didn't have to have all 10 of those functions trying to access the RAM independently. So what we end up getting is the data being fetched and then pushed into the threads rather than the threads fetching. So before we did that memory access synchronization, it would have been about 1,000 memory accesses for this example, and after it was reduced to only 100. So that helps uh, um, alleviate the, the bottleneck. The other pattern that we saw very frequently was this idea of windows. So you may have a number of threads, and they're operating on a slightly different region of an array. So here they're operating on five, uh, four uh, array elements, and each thread is operating on a window shifted by one. So one thread's operating on those elements, another thread's operating on those elements, another thread's operating on those. So we can still use this memory access synchronization technique to, to reduce the amount of uh, data uh, being fetched from RAM. Again, you have your smart DMA here, and you have a buffer here that you're using. And so when the threads get activated, so you synchronize the, access of the, the activation of the threads, and then you read in a, a big chunk of data, put it into the buffer, and then push into each thread the actual data that they need. So. This is kind of a neat thing that you can do with FPGAs that's a little harder to do with multi-cores. You can really synchronize the threads in this way. Yeah? Like a, a, a custom uh, cache, cache memory. Yeah, that's what you're doing. And, 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 and you're only reading, you're not writing. Well, you, you, could, you could extend this concept to the other side so that the threads could be writing out to another type of buffer in a very intelligent way. It's the neat thing that you can do here is you can do this sort of analysis and you're basically creating a custom multi-core system with a custom memory system. So all this customization enables you to, to get rid of a lot of the overhead that occurs um, in more general purpose systems. And if I understand, that was part of your project this summer was to find that overhead and show how FPGAs are much more efficient because uh, they can do things more directly rather than having to have this very general way of doing things, which results in any specific thing having a lot of overhead. Right? Okay, so in this example, we've got 400 memory accesses reduced down to 100 or so. Okay, so um, compared to a four core device, in this case four arms, and I think now we're up to 400 megahertz, as, as our experiments went on, the, the frequency was going up. Um, so compared to a forearm device, we took a bunch of examples that were um, embarrassingly parallel. I mean, these are, these are standard benchmarks, but these are they're highly parallelizable benchmarks, just to be, to be honest about it. Um, compared to a forearm, what we got was um, using thread warping, uh, we can get speed ups of uh, 130x. And here we are. Uh, just the, when Greg shows results, he does the arithmetic and the geometric. So there's your geometric. Um, by the way, you can see why it's important to show the geometric because look at the arithmetic is 130 and the geometric is 38. So, but that's because of that big outlier there, the 502 and the 308. We didn't have those huge outliers in the other data. Um, okay, but then there's a very reasonable question. Sure, you're using FPGA, but remember the pictures I showed you of FPGA? They're huge, right? <laughs> so you had the little ARM processor up in the corner, and then the rest of the chip was FPGA, right? So, well, gosh, what if I just put more and more cores on the chip? Maybe I would have gotten this sort of speed up also. So why do I really have to use FPGAs? So what we did was we also looked at uh, uh, multi-core systems ranging up to 64 ARM 11s. Um, and so we, we actually wrote a very optimistic simulator, one that doesn't, assumes that memory is always accessible, there's no contention for the bus, there's, uh, you know, there's no cache coherency issues, nothing. Um, so a very optimistic multi-core simulator. And then we compared that to a more pessimistic thread warping approach where we actually are paying attention to the memory synchronization. So the speed ups I'm gonna show you now uh, would actually be greater. They would be, they would be better. But even with that approach, that fairly pessimistic FPGA approach, we see that an eight core system doesn't get us that much. Uh, 16 core, you know, it's better than a four core, but it's not approaching uh, what thread warping can do. There's the 32 core system, which is using about the same amount of area 
as the FPGA that we were using. So you can see it's, it is giving you some speed up, but nothing compared to what we're able to do with the FPGA. And that's the same amount of area now. And we even went further. We said, what if we even had 64 cores? And again, it's getting better, but your thread, you can see that the FPGA really buys you a lot. Any questions on thread warping? Okay. There you assume that there is no contention on the memory bus. So more or less everybody hits on the cache. That the problem is in bias in the parallel, so there is no synchronization between threads on the body core. So you're giving basically as good as it gets. Is that right? Uh, well, was there so anything you could do on the body core to make it better? <clears throat> the, the assumption on the, on the ap applications, we didn't make any assumptions on it. We just chose applications that had lots of parallelism, okay? Because we wanted to show the potential of thread warping. In terms of the assumption that I was stating, the assumption was working against us. I was, I was giving a multi-core system the absolute benefit of the doubt, assuming that data was always available when it needed it. Whereas when looking at the FPGA that we were doing, which is we're trying to show the potential of that, we, that was that was accurate. So um, when I said that when I made assumptions in terms of the access of data, that was working against thread warping. So. And, and the cores of the newfangled single thread is simplistic things, not super scalar or anything. Karma lemons. Okay. Yeah. So. Which are good embedded processors, but they're not nothing compared to desktop, of course. Yeah. So are you using a, a pre-computed offline profile to find these hotspots that you're um, accelerating with FPGAs, or are you finding those on the fly as well? So let me show you. So, so all the data that I showed you doesn't take into account that time to do the actual uh, CAD, right? Which is what you're getting at, right? Um, okay, so... Um, uh, when, wh how can we then apply this technique for real, right? Wh when can we actually do this sort of warping? So we have this SGI Altix machine that has the 64 itaniums and the FPGAs. Um, some jobs that run on there run for, for dozens of hours, if not m multiple days. You're doing storm simulations and end body simulations, you know, physics types calculations and so on. So um, those are very long running applications. Uh, might be dozens of hours, whereas the CAD might be a couple hours, just using normal tools, not our, not our faster 10x faster tools. Just using normal Xilinx tools, CAD might be a few hours, and once the CAD is done, then you switch over, for, instead of running it in its normal software mode, at this point it switches over to using FPGA, and so then it runs to completion in much less time. So you can get speed up that way. So for these long-running applications, uh, warp processing is, is, is immediately applicable. The other scenario where it becomes applicable is in recurring applications, which is uh, common in embedded as well as desktop systems. Um, and so here, when, a, when the application first runs on the microprocessor, we might uh, fire off our on-chip CAD tools, but the on-chip CAD tools might run you know, 10 times longer than the actual application. Uh, so the application may end, and our CAD tools still haven't finished yet, okay? But they can keep plugging away, just keep, keep churning away at that. That application may come and go several times, and we may not be able to do anything for it. But then at some point in the future, when CAD is done, and we load up that application, we say, oh, we've got an accelerator for it, let's use it now. And so then, um, then from that point on, whenever that application runs, you can uh, get that sort of speed up. So. That sort of address your question. So, um, yeah, that's a that's a that's, that's a very big part of it. Um, just that um, I was also curious about before you run the CAD and so on. You, you also presumably, you know, you're you're only building specialized circuits for particular subkernels. And the question is, um, if you're using um, profiling, etc., to find those, is that also included in this? what I'm seeing on the screen, or um, is that also run 
magically offline in some space that we're not seeing the cost of here? Uh, so the, the profiler was part of the whole warp warping process. If you remember the initial slide I showed, the, the things were going by on the bus. We have a profiler and the CAD tools. Those are both dynamic. So you don't have to know beforehand what the kernels are. Is that okay, what, so yeah. it is finding it during this, this initial microprocessor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the profiling is part of that. Yeah. yeah. When you run the application a second time, how do you make sure you're, you have, you're running exactly the same application, not, uh, not one revision up? Good question. Uh, depends on the platform we're dealing with. The complexity of solving that problem depends on the platform we're dealing with. So. Yeah. Well, one thing that that did back when they were introducing the alpha was to compile overnight box binaries for end of alpha and the next day you have the running and that so in actually deployed systems, you know, changing the binaries is actually a serious entertaining thing. That's a good point. I should use that as an example. As as this concept of optimization, offline opti or, or runtime optimization, having been used before. The other thing, where we, where we do one thing we can do in our group is we use a full system simulator, so you don't have to cripple the processor since you have as much time as you wish, anyways. And that application will run for months in the employee business environment. Okay. The most common question that I usually get is, why don't you just do this statically? Why are you going through all this trouble to try to do it dynamically? Um, and this is the answer. Uh, first of all, the static approach definitely has uh, a big role to play. The, the offline, figure out what parts should go where, create a binary that consists of the microprocessor binary and the FPGA binary and distribute that. That has a big role. But it has some limitations. It requires some specialized language in many cases, and definitely requires a specialized compiler. Um, and you know, people don't like using specialized tools. The software industry is very big. FPGAs are still a relatively small part, and uh, we can't ask. You know, it's sort of like the dog, the tail wagging the dog. We can't ask the whole software industry to start supporting FPGAs uh, when we know that it's going to be a smaller piece of peop uh, component of people that are going to use it. So uh, if we can do it dynamically, you can use any language, any compiler, you can have object files that you're, 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 you're getting from third party vendors and you know, putting that all together into a binary. You don't, just don't, you don't have to have any knowledge of the FPGA existing. It doesn't affect your tool flow at all. So that makes it available to everybody, just like caches are available to everybody. Um, if you have warped processing, it enables this concept called expandable logic, um, which, which I named it that uh, to compare it to expandable RAM, expandable memory. So think about expandable memory. You have your binaries, you're all downloaded on your, your processor, you've installed them, you've been running them, and you decide you need more power. Things are running too slow. So what do you do? You add more RAM. And invisibly, the, o the OS detects it um, and, and uses it, and you get um, better performance. So likewise, we'd like to be able to support expandable logic, logic representing the FPGA. So you might have no FPGA. You might have one FPGA originally, and you decide, I'm not getting enough performance. And so what you'd like to be able to do is uh, just add in more FPGA and you get better performance. And you just don't have to reinstall anything, recompile anything. Um, this just shows how expandable logic can be added to improve things. Here's an in-body simulation, uh, which is a physics type simulation. Adding some logic helps and then at some point it just tapers off. On the other hand, here's an a, a image processing application where the more FPGA you added, the more performance benefit you got. So up to 250x, and it may have even gone more if we could have added more FPGA. So there is, you know, for most examples, there's some place where, it, where it, it tapers off, but for many, you can keep adding and it keeps growing. Uh, this is our most recent results, by the way. This is just a few months ago uh, out of University of Florida. And this is, this is now comparing to, 
a 3.2 gigahertz Intel Xeon. And you can see we're still getting speed ups of up to 8x compared to this very high end, fairly high end processor. And this is, this is taking into account all the, all the communication over the PCI bus and so on. So um, uh, I thought that was kind of neat that he was able to get that running. That's Greg's work. Oh, you're saying you plug multiple boards, just like you plug multiple RAM chips. That's, that's a thing. The expandable logic concept. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is some very recent work uh, that actually Scott Surway had done. Uh, um, so you know, it depends a lot. The question is, can you take these circuits that people have been putting on FPGAs, and can you model them as C? So I've been looking at it the opposite for the most of this talk. I'm just looking at C code, and people had no idea FPGAs existed, and seeing if we can speed them up. But there's a whole community out there that's designing circuits for FPGAs. Can we model their circuits in C, and have them execute a microprocessor, and then speed them up with FPGAs? And so what Scott did is he went through, uh, there was about 70 examples uh, from a conference called FCCM, Field Programmable Custom Computing Machines. And we found about 70 papers that talked about special circuits that uh, were designed just for FPGAs to speed up um, uh, thing, uh, computation. And he, he looked at every other one, basically half of them, and tried to see if he could write C code that he could then synthesize back to the circuit. And it turns out 82% of the cases he could. What is deceleration? Is that one of the examples? Scott, do you remember what that is? Title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds easy, right? I can slow down yeah, software. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, there must be something to it. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Anyway, we found out that 82% of those circuits that people had designed for FPGAs as circuits that we could model in C and synthesize back. So that's very that's very promising. Uh, that tells us that uh, FPGAs used for computation. Uh, uh, can be used in an environment where there's microprocessors and we just move things over to the FPGA as needed uh, to the extent that the FPGAs are available. Okay, and uh, these were some of the results that Scott got where he showed that um, uh, the custom design circuit that the people had published in the papers um, had some speed up. We normalized all those to one and then the speed up that we got by writing C code and synthesizing it down to a circuit you can see we get similar speed ups along the way. And in some cases, we, oh, these are, sl going up is bad here, right? <laughs> yeah, so in some cases we were slower, but in many cases we were the same. Okay, have you guys heard this, the uh, parable about the, the three blind men or th who walk up to an elephant and uh, one grabs the tail, one's holding the side, touching the side and one's grabbing the trunk and saying, uh, and then they have an argument one says an elephant's like a rope. The other one says no, an elephant's like a wall. And the other one says no, an elephant's like a tube. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Um, well, I like that parable in, ter in terms of FPGAs here. So the whole world has been looking at software for many years now as microprocessor instructions. And I think those of us in the FPGA community are starting to say, look, there's another aspect of software, FPGA circuits. Um, uh, it's not just instructions anymore. Uh, this very spatially oriented, highly parallel way of doing computation is just as much software as instructions are. And we need to start thinking of computation in terms of these spatial ways of doing things because we can get huge speed ups in execution if we do. I used to have this on the other side at the tail and I got comments about how that looked kind of bad so I put it at the front there. Um, so warp processing brings, uh, potentially brings the, the, the FPGA speed ups to all computing because we make it invisible. If we, you know, so uh, we got a patent back in 2007. Um, it's been licensed to these companies via SRC. Microsoft isn't part of SRC yet. So um, you guys are starting to do more and more architecture research, FPGA research. Um, hopefully you guys will come into SRC soon. Um, and uh, we're doing uh, extensive work on this right now. Um, Scott's working on it. We have a couple more students working doing online CAD algorithms, architectures, and uh, how to model things at the high level 
in order to get them to work well in FPGAs. So. Any other questions? Yes. If you go back to the 82% slide, a lot of the algorithm says requires expense, extensive modification to architecture. Let's see. Uh, well, template matching. Heavy modification for original algorithm. No, it's not record. It's a few of them. Uh huh. Heavy so is that, okay. uh, you, did you really take the FPGA or took the... Well, the, the, the the, when, when we say the, the original algorithm, sometimes what these papers did was they took some common algorithm, let's say quicksort, mm -hmm. and they said, how can we implement this as a circuit? And they went down and implemented um, some crazy circuit that didn't look anything like quicksort anymore. It was maybe merge sort or something like that. Right? Um, and then we said, okay, can we take that circuit and reverse engineer it back to something in C that will synthesize back to that same circuit. So when we go back up to C, it doesn't look anything like this very intuitive algorithm. It's some very you know, spatially oriented thing. So instead of just having a for loop that's walking through an array, maybe we have 12 functions and each one's connected by global variables or something like that. So that's what we mean by heavy modification. right? But it'll still execute on a microprocessor correctly, and it'll still synthesize down to circuits. So, so basically, you, we are making the case, you were making the case for a C to gate as opposed to a very long. Mm -hmm. We're saying C is surprisingly effective at modeling these circuits. Yeah. As long as you have a good high-level synthesis tool, uh, you can regenerate these circuits um, quite easily. So you don't really have to do register transfer level modeling for a lot of these things. Now that's true for this domain because these are mostly computations, they're not timing specific. And so, you know, it doesn't really matter that we lost the timing, uh, some of the clocking information. If there is some clocking information, it's mostly in terms of coarse grain pipelining, which we can capture at the C level by different functions, and a good high level synthesis tool will result in a, in a good pipeline for that. Any other questions? It's another take that I heard from um, uh, Wayne Look. Mm -hmm. He was looking at decom decompilation from the point of view of verification. So you take something and compile it down and then decompile it and see if the actually matches the specifications. Mm -hmm. and you want it. Is that something that you could think of uh, adding into the fry here? So not just speeding up, but adding other functionality. <coughs> Now that we're paying the price for doing all this work, is there something else that we can get out of it? Yeah, that's a good idea. So you could, what are some other avenues you could get out? You could get um, uh, some sort of verification uh, ability, right? So some sort of checking, perhaps, that you could, you could regenerate a high-level model that will execute reasonably fast, and then you could check to see if the results that your circuit is creating are Portability consistent. Hmm? Portability. Portability, yeah. Um, uh, reverse engineering to a high level spec that then people could manipulate if they needed to. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting point. It's, uh, several avenues that could come from that. Yeah. yeah. So how do you use it today? Let's say I want to speed up my program today and want to just use FPGAs, even for some custom scientific app or collaborative filtering, you know, anything where you're trying to do really intensive computation on very simple operations, but you want to either go very parallel. But do you plug in a board? I mean, what do you use to do that? Well, what we did was we showed the feasibility um, that this, this idea of warping is, is possible. Um, and so now I think it's up to people who have platforms to consider, you know, right now everybody who has a platform pretty much is focusing on, okay, how do we program this thing statically? Um, and I think it's up to them now to start saying, okay, well, we, it's feasible to do it dynamically. Um, for our particular platform, what does that mean? Right? Do we need to put a CAD tool on a third core here and, um, and, and start dealing with this or, or, or what? So, uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks for your time.